Hi, I'm uh, Bill Dixon. I'm here to interview uh, retired warden James Bruton, who is also so an author, the author of Big House, a Life Inside a Supermax Security Prison. Uh, uh, warden uh, Bruton, are you there? I am. How are you today? Uh, uh, good. And um, I might mention that we're talking to Warden Bruton uh, via telephone line. He is back in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, I wonder, what, uh, what prison were you a warden at, uh, Warden Bruton? I was uh, at the uh, Maximum Security Prison at Oak Park Heights, Minnesota, which is over on the eastern border of the Twin Cities area. And uh, what prompted you to write this book? Well, it was, uh, it, it was kind of interesting. I really never thought I was going to get into being uh, an author or into the book publishing business or anything at all like that. But uh, after spending about 34 years in the corrections business with many of those years inside institutions, I just found that uh, it was such a fascinating world that I worked in and there were so many people. I teach part-time in several colleges and so many students and people who came through on tours that were just absolutely fascinated about this world uh, that's inside the walls of high security prisons. And uh, I just thought it might be interesting to write about that uh, crazy world I worked in every day. So you had done multiple jobs before you became a warden in the corrections uh, industry, is that right? I, I did. I, I actually worked at Oak Park Heights uh, for a total of nine years, and uh, I ran another institution at one time. But I had quite a quite a, a different type of career. I was a probation officer for many years. I worked in a juvenile center. I was a member of our state parole board for a period of several years. I worked in central office as a deputy commissioner and was the first investigator hired in the prison, and so I had a, a quite a variety of jobs uh, before I settled in as warden, uh, which was the last several years before I retired. Uh, by the way, I think that was the, the job I probably enjoyed the most. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the interesting part of going to work in that kind of environment every day was, uh, was certainly like nothing else. What's the, what was the name of this prison? That you uh, were... Minnesota Correctional Facility, Oak Park Heights. Okay, and about how many prisoners did it have? Uh, right now, it's uh, it's uh, there's a new been a new unit added, so it, it runs about 450 inmates. Most of the years that I was there, it uh, was generally around 400 inmates. Well, you know, my understanding of reading the book, uh, this is a pretty uh, a tough uh, inmate population. Is that true? Yeah, it sure is. Uh, we used to have a previous warden that that used to say these guys aren't here for singing too loud in the church choir. They've committed some pretty violent and atrocious kinds of acts, and most of the inmates. Uh, there, about 95% had been involved in some type of a crime uh, where a victim was injured, uh, person type offenses. About half of the people I walked around every day had uh, killed somebody. So it was a pretty distilled population. Um, and if you weren't there for that kind of a crime, you were there because you were a management problem somewhere else. So it was, uh, it was quite a giant melting pot that these guys would go through before they'd end up at a at a place uh, with as tight a security as Oak Park Heights had. What, uh, what's life like inside uh, that kind of prison? You know, it, 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 was, uh, it was absolutely incredible. I, I had a student ask me one time what it was like to go to work every day in a maximum security prison, and I thought for a second, and I said, you know, it's kind of like going to work in the twilight zone. And, and she said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, and I thought about it for a second, and I said, you know, other people get up in the morning and they, they take a shower and they eat breakfast and they drive to work and that's just what I did and and then they uh, you know pull into their parking lot at work just like me and then they get out of their car and they walk into the office just like I did 
but then everything changed for me because I went into a world of, of maximum security where somebody had to open every door I went through, where all of my clients that I dealt with every day were were filled with misrepresentations, uh, deceits, lies, uh, and uh, I felt like it was it was like you were constantly in a giant chess game trying to stay a move ahead of your opponent, and it was uh, just a fascinating and uh, very, very interesting job. Well, you know, I remember uh, you said something about the criminal mind, and uh, what what is it about the criminal mind, or is there a criminal mind in your opinion? Well, I, I, I think there is. I, I've been a teacher, as I mentioned, for many years part-time, and I, I enjoy teaching those kinds of courses, criminology, and and talking about how criminals think and so forth, and it, it truly is. It's a it's a value system that's so different from the way most of the people in the free world live, or people who have never experienced the criminal part of society. And uh, it's I had an inmate say to me one time that uh, we live in an upside down world, and I asked him what that meant, and he said because it, it's a world where everything we think is good, you think is bad. And he said, for example, killing a police officer in your world is is very bad. In our world, that's very good. We we uh, you know look upon somebody who's done something like that as a hero. Uh, you know, we we live in a world where you know stealing and doing different things like that is okay, and in your world it isn't. And he went on with a whole list of things like that. But I, I've been most fascinated through the years by the. Uh, the various elements in the criminal mind of value systems and systems that are so foreign to most of us who have lived our lives in the free world of we're taking a life or stealing or doing something that, we, that most of us would never think of doing as we live our lives a, a normal way uh, becomes routine. And uh, it was very difficult sometimes to talk to somebody that, that had taken many lives or knowing that it, even though that person is friendly or cooperative, that to talk to them that's fine, but they also might take your life if it meant getting out the front door or getting something they needed. And that was hard, even after 30-some years in the business, to understand how people think like that. Did you ever talk directly to any of them? That well, I went inside every day as much as I possibly could. I felt it was a very important part of my job, and I got to know most of the offenders uh, in some cases pretty well. Uh, there were a handful of people uh, when I left the prison that I had known for uh, almost uh, 30 years um, that had started out in the system with me as kids and, and uh, you know, progressed through the adult system. And when I left uh, the prison and retired, there were about five or six that I had known over 30 years that uh, had known them when they were kids, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. And pretty sad that they've spent their entire life in that type of an environment. Well, in other words, when you became warden of this prison, you saw those people, those people that you had seen 20, 30 years ago in that prison? Some uh, had known him most of those years in various roles. So when I was on the parole board or in some of the other capacities, uh, they were continued to be in trouble. And, and I, I just felt it was important every day to get, get down inside. And so I, uh, you know, talked with them in the gym, talked with them in the hallways, out in the yard, uh, sometimes in their cells. I, I just felt it was an important part of being a warden to get downstairs and, and talk, to the, talk to the inmates and kind of get a feel of, what's going on inside the institution. And it was uh, certainly, I always used to say that if I, if I forgot my notes some night for class, I could just walk around the prison for a couple hours and I'd have enough stories to fill up the couple hours of teaching that night because it was, uh, it was an interesting day every single day. So if you would see one of these guys you'd saw 30 years ago, uh, would they say, hi, warden, or how did oh, yeah, that work? Yeah, I mean, these were people that, uh, that I didn't mean to imply that I hadn't seen them for 30 years. I'd just been continually seeing them through all these years. Oh, yeah, I knew them very well. Uh, I, uh, many of them would, uh, you know, tell somebody, hey, that used to be my probation officer, or I've known this warden for a long time. And, yeah, I mean, it was a... Uh, you know, you always try to separate your personal life and, and ever sharing anything personal with inmates, but uh, there's nothing wrong with being being friendly and cordial and having conversations with, uh, with people you've known for a long time. Now, as I understand it, uh, at least uh, from the book, you mentioned that this, uh, this prison that you uh, were the head of was one of the most secure prisons in the world. Well, I, I truly believe that. I've, I've been around the country and seen most of... Uh, most of the high security prisons. I've been out to the federal, uh, uh, new federal facility out in Florence, Colorado, three different times. I've seen the the uh, high tech uh, Colorado State Prison, the one out in Pelican Bay in California, and, and many of them. And, and uh, even though Oak Park Heights was one of the most secure, we used many of the other 
institutions to build a, a new unit that opened last year that uh, I truly believe is is now made it the most secure prison uh, ever built. Uh, there's never been even an attempted escape in the 23 years it's been open, and so the security of the facility, uh, from what I've seen anyway, I can I can attest to the fact that there's no, it's. Uh, it takes no second place to any any place that I've been in. Now, if, uh, you mentioned in your book something about a philosophy about uh, keeping a prison clean and neat. Uh, would you kind of expound on that? Yeah, I, I've I've always been kind of a fanatic on that, and I, I think sometimes to the peril of some of the staff that didn't necessarily feel that was important. But I I, I always felt like an institution uh, operated uh, by the way it looked, and if you came in the front door and you saw a place that wasn't clean and and spit shined and and looked good, then it probably operated uh, pretty badly. And I have been in some prisons around the country where that that held true. I came in and the place was dirty, and uh, you go down into the cell blocks, and the cell inmates are not uh, forced to keep their cells looking neat, and uh, you've got scuffs in the hallways, and you've got you know marks on the walls and different kinds of things. And in almost every case that I can remember, that the place looked like that, it operated like that. And so I. I think the way something looked, uh, particularly in a, in a prison's operation, will be very, very indicative of how it operates. And I was just uh, very, very uh, careful to make sure that the place looked good all the time. And I thought uh, in the book that you mentioned something about rewarding good behavior and that kind of thing. Well, Would you I, kind of go on? Well, I've developed and, and learned from some, some real strong philosophies about how you run a prison, and I have been a strong believer that when you've got a population that settles their problem by vi problems by violent means, you better find a way for them to get up every day and look forward to something. And so we've built in Minnesota, and, and uh, particularly at, at Oak Park Heights through the years, a very strong philosophy about uh, rewarding good behavior and giving good incentives for people to behave so that you get good rewards by behaving. You behave yourself all day long, you get an opportunity to go to the gym at night or you get an opportunity to go out in the yard or maybe go to school during the day or go to work or whatever the case might be. And and so it's very, it's very uh, easy for inmates to understand that if I behave myself, I'm going to get some rewards. I don't like being here, but I can make this pleasant uh, as pleasant to stay as possible by the way I behave, and, and it works, and it's very effective, and, and uh, I've been a very strong believer of that. Well, uh, and I understand you have uh, a, a gym that's equipped with weight, weightlifting apparatuses? Yeah, that... absolutely. I, I mean, you know, through the years I've always heard, you know, legislators and various politicians and people say, oh, they got weights or they got TV sets or whatever the case might be, and and the people who are complaining about that, they really don't understand. I, I mean, most wardens that run institutions aren't inmate advocates, but we certainly understand what it takes to run a prison safely. I mean, why would I care if an inmate goes down to the gym and lifts weights and that's something they look forward to every day and they get up in the morning and they look forward to that um, and and uh, they keep their nose clean uh, as a result of uh, give, being given that opportunity. I've never known of a case where somebody became a better criminal because they were in good condition or good shape. Um, I've never, rarely did we ever have any trouble in the gym. Um, the inmates recognized and knew that that was something that uh, if they gave us any trouble, they were going to they were going to lose it. And most people respond to that pretty well, and we've had some pretty good success with it. What about the argument that uh, strong prisoners uh, uh, may overcome guards or something like that? Well, I've never seen it happen. I mean, I've never ever encountered a case where we had to have a discussion about that this guy was so strong because we allowed him to go down to the gym and lift weights. I, I just have never had that ever occur. And so, um, as I say, most of the of the individuals will recognize uh, what a privilege that is and an opportunity for them to do something um, well, with their bodies and with their physical health, and they uh, they don't uh, use it to their uh, advantage against us. I I think in the, uh, another point with that is that when you've got a, a group of inmates who uh, are not allowed to keep keep themselves physically. So you got to remember, you've got people here who have abused their bodies throughout their lives. They've used alcohol, they've used drugs, they've had poor eating habits, bad nutrition, and so the more you can encourage, you know, people getting in good shape and and uh, having uh, nutritional type diets and so forth, the, the less cost you're going to be paying to take care of these people when they're sick and ill. 
um, that are serving long, long sentences. I, I, I recall in the book you had something about types of prisoners. Uh, there's, there's kind of a hierarchy or something. Is that true? Well, there sure is. I, I mean, no, no doubt about that. And I, I would, my, the way I always made the list up was that uh, uh, at the top of the list, of course, were the were the uh, 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 inmates who had killed police officers. It seemed through the years that those who had committed that atrocious crime were were always looked upon by other inmates as kind of heroes, uh, that they had done something, you know, really great and, and so forth. And also up at the top of that list would be your lifers, uh, people who have committed a, a horrible crimes, uh, first-degree murders, uh, sometimes inmates who have used weapons in the crimes, uh, robbers, uh, people who have committed, this, in some cases, violent assaults, but always when the victims are not children. I mean, children victims are, are frowned upon by most of the population. And as you go down that pecking order, toward the bottom of the list, of course, are the sex offenders, and, and right at the very bottom would be the child molesters. They are looked upon as being the absolute worst. And many of the inmates uh, feel that way because they are in a position where they cannot protect their own children who are out on the streets. And they wonder about these people who might be preying on kids, and so it's a uh, it's a pretty uh, interesting type of pecking order that they have developed through the years. I thought the one chapter that you had on fatal attraction was uh, kind of interesting, and uh, maybe you could expound a little bit it's about a, that. Yeah, it's a, it's an incredible uh, piece of pieces of information in there. I tell numerous. Uh, the book is filled with about oh, 50 or 60 different anecdotal type type stories that relate to different uh, themes and so forth throughout the book. But that the chapter you mentioned on fatal attractions is the experiences I've had through the years with um, with women that become involved with inmates in a maximum security prison uh, and the, the incredible uh, type of uh, relationships that develop. And if I had spent my career working in a women's prison, I could give the same kind of stories, I'm sure, by men that get caught up in uh, in the dilemma of uh, of becoming involved with women inmates but I didn't work in the women's prison so I my stories all relate to women that got involved with with men and just some incredible stories of uh, of uh, various uh, women that uh, have formed these love relationships with these uh, killers and and rapists and and long-term offenders that uh, they're just bizarre and I tell several of those stories uh, about uh, how these relationships have become ruined and and uh, horribly um, um, involved with, uh, with these people, horribly involved with some of these uh, very, very dangerous inmates. How is it doing time for a prisoner? You know, I've said through the years, I've been in those cell blocks and in the cells, and I've dealt around with offenders and worked many years in institutions, and I, I can honestly say I have no idea what it's like to do a day at a time. I uh, always went home at night, and uh, I don't know how they do it. Uh, when I worked at Oak Park Heights for a number of years, uh, and then left and did other things in the in the in the uh, corrections business, and then returned as warden uh, ten years later, and some of the guys were still there. Nothing had changed. Uh, they were still doing the same thing, um, uh, and uh, it, it was amazing. And I wondered, how do they do this? How do they do this kind of time day after day after day? And and uh, they do, and they become some institutionalized and. And as much as it must be tremendously difficult to do the time, uh, somehow they seem to be able to do it. I, I think I would have a lot of trouble. And I honestly don't know what it must be like to do a day at a time when that door shuts at night and you've lost control. I did, uh, I did uh, for a number of years, Bill, I did uh, parole revocation hearings. And probably uh, I figured out one time maybe a little over 2,000 of them. And, and in many of those hearings, I wound up sending the offenders back to prison, and I always thought it was the toughest decision you could ever make is to take somebody's freedom away from them. And when I've seen some of these guys who I've known for 30 years and their freedom has been in completely in somebody else's control all the time, I just don't know how they do it. You know, I, but reading your book, I, I noticed that at some of these parole hearings, these guys would say things that were just kind of, that was a no-brainer to keep them in. Well, uh, I tell uh, I, I had had the experiences through the years of of doing a lot of lifer hearings, first degree murder hearings in Minnesota. We don't have a parole board any longer, and so the release authority is under the commissioner of corrections, and and who sets up a, a an advisory panel to do the hearings. And I've had uh, uh, my experience through the years has been on many of those panels, and I cite several cases of uh, of some of these comments that some of these guys make. And for example, I talk about a guy who. When it uh, when the hearing was over and it became time to uh, 
to ask him if he had anything final to say before the panel deliberated on whether he was going to be considered for release or not. The guy said, yeah, I've got something I'd like to say. And, and uh, he was said, well, go ahead and say it. And he said, uh, I might do this again. And I always, I always thought that that was one of the one of the more interesting comments that a first-degree murderer would say, because if you say, I might do it again, you're not going to get released. There's no doubt about that, but that's what this guy said, I might do this again. And, and as, as we go into a lot of other detailed cases about some of the most horrific crimes and what some of these uh, guys have said at their hearings and, and so forth. It just, uh, it's a fascinating world, and it's, uh, it, it just made it a very interesting book. Uh, so it was fun to write, and uh, fun to hear the good feedback I've been getting from uh, it. Warden Bruton, you mentioned, I noticed you had one whole chapter uh, uh, entitled The Human Monster. What, who was that? Well, this was a guy uh, who came to us from another state uh, back in the early 80s when the prison first opened. Uh, I was the investigator at the prison at the time, and we opened uh, we opened the doors and uh, with uh, several uh, inmates, uh, opening uh, one unit at a time. But we took a took a guy from another state, and uh, I just uh, he just earned a whole chapter in the book. He was probably the worst uh, inmate to manage that I've ever seen. Uh, he was involved in the better part of uh, several months destroying our brand new segregation unit and actually what we wound up eventually doing the warden at the time a guy by the name of frank wood uh, had decided that this guy was so good at what he did that he was such an expert in his craft of destroying prison cells and state property and so forth that he would uh... use him as an unpaid consultant for us and that we would just continue to build and reconstruct things that he destroyed until we could finally get a cell that he couldn't uh, destroy anymore, and, and we did, and got him completely under control, took about three or four months, and then we built a, uh, a number of cells uh, with that kind of construction, and so he did some good for us. But I uh, I thought he was worthy of a whole chapter, and uh, and I entitled it The Human Monster because I never met anybody quite like him. Did he ever leave the, the prison system? He did, he did leave uh, after the three or four months, after his consulting work was over. He, he left, we sent him back to another state, and the interesting part of that story is it got back to us uh, sometime later that uh, the state that we sent him back to wound up making a trade of, uh, with him to another state where the, the other state uh, sent five of their worst prisoners for this guy, and that only lasted six, 60 days or so before they came and took their five back and said, come and get this SOB because we don't want him here. So he, he, was, uh, he was one of a kind, and uh, I felt he was certainly worthy of a whole chapter in the book. So I, yeah, you know what I thought very interesting was that uh, you mentioned uh, prison prison systems trade prisoners. Is that true? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty common. Uh, there's uh, most states have a have a uh, connection to what's called the interstate compact, and where each state uh, is involved in uh, contractual arrangements where you can send prisoners to other states. Uh, sometimes it's on a day-for-day -day basis. Sometimes it's on a money basis, a per diem basis. Uh, but most states have it, uh, not only in the institution part of it, but for field uh, services and probation and parole as well. And it, uh, it just works out good. A lot of, a lot of cases that are sent are, are for example, we, maybe, maybe we have a high-profile uh, a uh, horrifying sex offender case or something where a child is murdered and, and so forth. And those are the kind of people you just can't protect in the prison. And so you are able to transfer that person out to another state somewhere where they're, where they're not known and they can, can live a life inside the institution without being harmed. Uh, or maybe there's a compassionate transfer. Maybe somebody's family has moved to another state and so you transfer the person so they can be closer to home. There are a variety of reasons yep. come into existence as Warden. to why you might use that type of... Uh, uh, organizational transfer. Warden, I, I wanted to touch on, uh, I want you to uh, make a comment uh, uh, on one of your chapters entitled With Dignity and Respect and kind of go through that kind of philosophy for us, would you please? Well, you know, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to get the public to understand why, why you'd, uh, you'd uh, believe so strongly in that, but it, it, it's the only way, in my opinion, to manage a prison. It's uh, the only way to manage it safely, and it's the only way to make sure that that your staff are going to be safe inside every day, and that's uh, and I t entitled that chapter with dignity and respect because I feel so strongly about the way you manage a prison is uh, designed around a philosophy of how you treat people, and that you need to develop a prison atmosphere where you treat the inmates 
that the punishment is being in prison and it's not the job of the people who work there to punish those people every day because if you do, they're going to hurt you. And that's how you make your prison unsafe is by going down every day, and I'll be a little uh, embellish this a little bit by saying you go down every day and poke them with a hot stick and make their life miserable because you're going to be the one miserable. And then I don't mean you molly coddle inmates or you give them anything they want. I don't mean anything at all like that. You have c complete control and total uh, uh, involvement in every aspect of the operation, but you can do it in a dignified and respectful manner. And when you do that, uh, you'll find out rather quickly that inmates respect respect, they respond to it, and you're going to have a lot less trouble inside the institution. And besides that, it's just the right thing to do, the way you treat people. And I'm not an inmate advocate or an inmate lover. I'm a, I'm a former warden that ran a very tight ship and, and uh, f uh, felt the control was, uh, was the most important thing every day uh, when we operated that institution. It was our prison, not the inmates, and we did things the way we saw fit, but we did it in a respectful and dignified manner, and it was very, very important in would that you, underlying philosophy. Warden, would you ever do this over again? Um, I had a great career. I, I enjoyed it every single day. I, uh, there was never a day I say to my students now that if you can find a job where every day you get up and look forward to going, work, going to work, you got it made, and I can honestly tell you that I Never had a day that I didn't get up and look forward to going to work, but um, but I don't miss it. I uh, I worry more about uh, whether I ought to hit a wedge or a, or a nine iron now, and and uh, I still enjoy the teaching, and and uh, I think it was something I did, and and uh, I'm very glad I did. I have never had a had a regret of it. I enjoyed it, and it was uh, just a great career. It was something that most people can never experience, and and uh, I just found it fascinating. How did you separate your personal life from your prison life? It was, it was really very hard to do, and I, I think I, I, I honestly think I didn't realize the stress and the pressure I was under until I left. Um, I actually talk about in the last chapter walking out the door on the final day and uh, how I, I felt like my wife came out and they had a little ceremony at the prison and I left my, my state car keys on the desk and I left my pager and my cell phone and and I walked out the door, and I felt, I honestly felt like, I mean, it was like I was experiencing this, this giant, uh, magnificent grand piano being lifted from my shoulders. So I, I can tell you that there was never, there was never a day uh, when I was warden of the institution that the phone rang at my house that I warden? didn't think it was the prison. I mean, 99% of the time it wasn't. But every time that phone rang, I thought it, it was, or it could be. Every time that phone rang in the middle of the night, it generally was. And uh, I always used to say that nobody ever called me at home or on vacation or on my cell phone and said, things are going well at the prison today. That never happened. I always hoped that someday I'd get that call, but it never happened. Or, and so, you know, when you're on vacation and you walk into that dark motel room and the red light's blinking, you know it's not good news. And so it, it was something that I never got away from as much as I always tried to tell new recruits and other people to separate the job from your personal life. It's just something I was Warden, had trouble doing. We're, we've got to end the interview today. Uh, we're running out of time, and I appreciate your time. And uh, uh, my best to you, and thank you very much for uh, such an interesting book, The Big House, Life Inside a Supermax Prison. Well, thank you. I very much enjoyed it, and I appreciate your interest in it.